Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show, discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Welcome to the Books That Make You Show. I'm your host, Desiree Duffy. And today we're talking about books that make you shift to unleash your leadership potential in your career and your personal life, too, by becoming radically accountable. Our guest today is Elena Agaregamova. Did I get that right? Yep. I got, I got it right. I got it right. <laughs> Elena is a source of innovation and inspiration in the world of talent development and career coaching. She has a very remarkable career that has spanned from New York to Dubai, and she embodies a unique blend of expertise as a talent development expert, career coach, speaker, entrepreneur, podcast host, and of course, as an author. Now, Elena's approach is rooted in the belief that true excellence in career and leadership is achieved through a very holistic focus on both the professional growth that we need and our personal well-being. Elena's books include Shift and The Rough Guide to Awesome Leadership, alongside of her engaging podcasts, which are Shift with Elena Agar, and Confessions of a Career Coach, which serve as a resource for those eager to enhance their career and leadership skills. Elena, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. I'm excited to talk to you about leadership and positioning oneself as a leader, especially as it relates to someone's career, and in many cases in their early careers. Do you want to just give us the lay of the land and talk about your approach? Sure. So, you know, when we talk about leadership, there's, you know, there's a vast amount uh, uh, amount of information that's out there about how to be a good leader and so on. And what I often see is that it's a lot of external stuff. It's about like, how do you manage teams? How do you, you know, how, how do you approach conflict and so on? But we moved away from the holistic approach, which is really like about yourself, right? That self-awareness piece that your overall health and wellness, which influences how you operate, your critical thinking, your decision-making, which are so essential to you as a leader. So I always look at it from the inside out, right? Um, It's like, how can I be the best that I can be at my performance? Because only then can you truly uh, inspire and enhance performance of those around you. And when we talk about this, taking ownership is a key part of it. It's crucial. Um, And you have this philosophy about why it's important to produce rather to consume. Can you talk about that? Sure. So I think one of the things that we um, as a society have very carefully created is a society, um, uh, a group of people of uh, consumers. So if you think about it, when we're going through high school and then college, it's all about consuming, right? And it's all about that somebody's giving us directions and we're just meeting these metrics. And the metrics that we meet in high school and college and our early years are very different from the metrics that are expected in the workplace or just later on in your life in general. And by consuming, consuming, we're often forgetting um, our own critical thinking in the process because we're just consuming whatever information. So it's like our own internal algorithms that starts getting tuned into a certain way. And so I think it's not only impact, not only impacting negatively our leadership skills in the future, but also just our thinking process. And we become married to an idea very easily and married to a specific way of life very easily when the world of work and life in general is uh, requiring us to be a little bit more flexible flexible, a little bit more open-minded and a, just a little bit more, um, you know, uh, uh, transient in terms of how we approach things. So I think just moving away from being a consumer and realizing that you at some point also need to produce and, and to uh, produce and create, right, and to activate that part of your brain is something that often not talked about uh, in that transition from, you know, early education and college into career space and ultimately leadership. I think that a lot of the educational institutions are actually doing such a disservice to folks nowadays because you're right. And I've seen it because when you pull somebody onto your team, you're looking for that future leader. You're looking for somebody who's going to take that ball 
and run with it and to use your terminology to produce. So I think this is important too, so that folks realize that that is what a lot of businesses and firms are looking for. Absolutely. And I mean, to be fair to the institutions, you know, um, and, you know, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because that's a whole other topic, but they are doing something to try to kind of, you know, address that, but not fast enough. So that will be my critique to them, just not moving fast enough. And part of it is just because the bureaucracy of higher education institutions today. So or always really. Um, and, and another thing I wanted to also point out that leadership is not about just teams or leading teams and, you know, being a big leader in a company. It's just about the the characteristic of being a leader. And it's to your point, which you just mentioned, which is just taking initiative, being proactive, really, you know, kind of going out there and, and trying to create and produce versus just wait to consume the information, the knowledge, the directions. We've all heard of imposter syndrome, and we've probably all experienced it at some point. Can you talk about your personal battle with it and how you've turned that around? I'm still turning it around in, in full transparency, but um, I've struggled with it most of my life. I wasn't very academically strong when I even in high school and even through college. Um, kind of just kind of made my way. I always say like I just learned how to pass an exam, um, and so I've always struggled with not feeling like I'm I'm you know I'm I'm smart realistically. And so it took me a long time of building my own credibility with myself to say, well, you know, just because I'm not smart in math <laughs> or I can't pass an accounting exam doesn't make doesn't mean that I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have other strengths. And so I think recognizing that everybody's unique, everybody's different. And it's hard because as a somebody who, like myself, like I want to achieve, I was, it drives me, you know, I really want to, you know, there's so many things I want to do and so on. And I feel like learning is never ending. And the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. And it's like this whole vicious cycle, you know, and some people are like, well, that doesn't sound healthy. And I think in some cases it might not be. In my case, it drives me. So in my case, it's kind of, I've turned the, the imposter syndrome to feed my drive. And I think that's worked well. And I hear that from a lot of people that are kind of like really just, you know, the overachievers by nature. I've heard a lot of that and it kind of makes sense to me. Um, but what I try to do is tap it when it's stopping me from doing something. So I have a good quote on my uh, whiteboard. It says, have fear, but don't have doubt. So I might be going into a situation terrified or not sure if I can do it or something like that. But I always say like, no, 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 like I can do it. And I have this conversation with myself and, and kind of go through it anyway. And I think that's just, you know, you know, training your brain to respond differently to conditioning, whatever conditioning you have gone through in your life for whatever experience you have. That's a great quote. I love that quote. And when you talk about when you, you're working with others, you are in talent development and you work in this sphere and you have empathy when you're working with others. Can you talk about when you are working with others and how that all comes together? Sure. So yeah, I work with individuals and also with uh, individuals outside of organizations on kind of like one to one, but also with groups in organizations. Um, and I fell into this field, honestly, and part of it is because I went through so much of like ups and downs and ebbs and flows in my career that I naturally realized that, hey, like a lot of people struggle with it. And hey, there's a whole career I can create out of this, which is talent development. Um, so I, I saw I, I work with people uh, primarily on helping them take that ownership, right? Like, you know, uh, you know, what does that look like in action? Like, what does it look like in behaviors? And um, as part of my experience as, as a personal trainer, I've also realized that there's a huge connection between performance in a workplace and our overall wellness. So when I work with individuals, I really start going back to the basics. So the basics that we often forget about, which are into three parts. So one is the physical well-being. So like, am I sleeping well? You know, am I eating well? Right? Am I, am I moving my body? And so on. The second part is the mental emotional. So, you know, am I in tune with my emotions and, you know, take it from somebody who was not in tune with her emotions for 25 years, not in a healthy way, at least. So I've gone through that journey. So there's levels to being in tune with your emotions. And, you know, every year of your life, every day, every month, you will reach that new level. So it's like a continuous journey. So the emotional piece is very important because it impacts everything else that happens around decision making, all of that. And then the third piece is the social, the environment, right? Like the environment that you're in, are you surrounding yourself with the right people? Um, are you creating and 
curating the right p- group of network around you and so on for you to 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 grow and be successful and be happy, whatever that means for you. So these are the three I always focus on. And we audit those pieces before we move on to anything else, because these are essential. I want to dig into those, unpack each and one of those just a little bit more if I could. And I also want to talk about radical accountability, but let's go back to the physical aspect of it and this idea of energy management. Can you discuss that? Yeah. So we all hear uh, time management. You need to learn how to manage your time. And I'm so happy that a lot of people are now turning towards like, hey, it's not really about time. It's about the energy. And now I don't know what it, what has happened. I'll say I can't pinpoint it to, uh, to a particular time. But over the last several years, I've seen a huge shift. And it could be because of social media and the exposure to these things. But there's been a huge shift towards our health and wellness as a society. And part of it is encouraging because so many more people are uh, out there promoting wellness and, and health and well-being and so on. But then the other kind of scary part is on the physical side is that although there's a lot of that information in there, uh, we're in America at least still, I think last statistics, like 70% of Americans are obese. So that number is actually growing. So there there is a disconnect. And I think part of that disconnect is that we keep trying to find um, magic pills and magic solutions to health and wellness and even career stuff. And there's not one magic pill. So, and I think because of the influx of social media and influencers, and everybody talks about five ways to do this and 10 ways to do that. And the reality is, is that you have to, going back to the radical accountability, is really understand yourself and where can you really audit your habits, your routines. You know, obviously, you know, there's a medical piece that goes into it, going to your doctor, making sure, you know, doing your blood work and so on. And and then creating, creating a, a sort of say lifestyle that works for you. And it's for everybody, it's different. Sure, there's some standard things, you know, like you need to move more, get some sunshine and sleep well. All of those are standard. But when it comes to wellness and physical activities and longevity, it's much deeper than that. And I think everybody needs to take that accountability and educate themselves about their bodies and not go by the, you know, by just the advice of one doctor, but actually you know, go to two, three doctors where possible or, you know, uh, do your own research um, and so on. And most importantly on this piece is to listen to your body. We don't listen to our bodies. Our bodies are designed to protect us and to uh, make sure we're living and okay. And so every time your body does something, whether it's inflammation, whether it's gaining weight around a particular area, whether it's some kind of pain, whatever may be, it's telling you something. It's, 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 It's ringing an alarm. And what do we do? We don't listen to those alarms. We take pain medications. We take medication. We have a drink. You know, we we ignore it and so on. Um, We numb ourselves down instead of listening and saying, where is this coming from? And being in tune with our bodies. That's where the physical aspect starts. I think that is so important. And we could probably have an entire discussion just on the physical aspects of it. Not only exercise, like you're talking about in the food we eat, but in the American diet, like you said, you know, we have an abundance of folks who are unfortunately obese and the food we eat, what we're putting into our bodies really matters. And you're right. It's not about just taking a pill. And that makes me want to lean over toward the mental health side a little bit, because you have this, this, this saying about the story that you tell yourself or the story, not you, but the story Mm -hmm. that one tells themselves. Can you talk about that and talk about how people sometimes might talk themselves into having anxiety, et cetera? Yeah. So um, I think in the past, again, several years, we have somewhere uh, blurred the line between I'm having just a bad day and stressed out, burnt out, depression. So it's normal to have a bad day. It's normal to have a bad week. It's normal to feel like crap. It's not normal to stay in it long term. But this is where I think a lot of us, and again, it could be because of the messaging on, and I think media, honestly, like I just, I keep coming back to media because media, it's mm-hmm. it's the exposure to all these different external stimuli, whether it's media, whether it's whatever you're reading, whoever you're around and so on, that influences you and almost tricks you into believing that you're burnt out. And, you know, and all these articles about, well, companies are pushing their employees to the brink of, et cetera. Uh, y- yes, but are, are they, or is there always a res- also that radical accountability? 
reality. So that's an external we cannot control. But as an individual, what can you control? And that's my whole thing about radical accountability is like, what can you control in your life? So when it comes to mental and emotional things, um, you know, really understanding, is it that you're just having a bad day? Or is something significantly wrong? And this is and because I think it doesn't it doesn't do justice to people who actually do have mental health issues that are clinical and so on. It's not fair to them if all of us are walking around and just saying, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. And we have to also be mindful of the messaging we're receiving from pharmaceutical companies, right? So the minute you hop on a happy pill, you're gonna be on that happy pill forever. Well, not always, but you know, in most cases. What we need to understand is there's natural ways to um, release serotonin and feel good chemicals in our body. Going back to case number one, which is the physical, getting out there, getting sunshine, getting, getting movement. If you if you audit all these these three pieces that we're talking about, and you're still feeling like, listen, I this is all good. I'm still not feeling like myself. Then okay, maybe you have a case for something beyond the you know a, a bad day type thing. Um, but we don't focus on those, right? The first thing we do, we go to a doctor and I mean, I've experienced this well. The first thing they, they, they want to prescribe you something. And what that does is it enters a chemical in your brain that then quiets down the natural chemicals. So guess what? The more you quiet down the natural chemicals, like if you go for an exercise, it releases those feel good chemicals, right? The more you quiet them down, the more they're going to be inactive and the more you're going to need that medication. And without it, you're going to be a mess. So this is just standard, right? And I think there's a lot of people that are medicated that should not be medicated. But again, not a doctor. It's just an observation. I think a lot of people can agree with that. So the mental piece is really comes down to um, understanding why do you feel the way that you feel? right? Um, what is it that's happening? Um, how do you, you know, what do you focus on? If you focus on, you know, I don't know, if you wake up and you watch 10 minutes of, of uh, news about the war and X, Y, and Z, or not 10 minutes, let's say an hour, right? That's going to impact the rest of your day. You're likely to not have a good day. That's just a reality because subconsciously you just packed all these negative things. If you yeah. wake up and you start, you wake up with, a, you know, fighting with your partner, that's going to impact your day. So I think it's just about like understanding even how do you, how do you start your day? What do you expose yourself to? Understanding that your brain is like a sponge and it soaks everything in. And if we just audit that and, you know, understanding where all of that garbage comes from that we then just spread out for the rest of the day is essential. And the final thing I'll mention here is just understanding what makes you angry. Why does it make you angry? What is the root cause of that emotion? Understanding where that feeling's coming from and emotion. We're all entitled to our feelings and emotions and so on. But where is it coming from? And tapping that, the root cause of it, before we just, again, ignore it or say, this is just how I am. Yeah, that is so important. I would just want to highlight what you said right there. Sometimes we're just in this reactive mode, to your point, social media and the news and things that are going on in our bodies and our lives. And it's all of a sudden a switch gets flipped and we're reacting without even realizing what, what made us react. Did somebody say something? Is it how this is going to impact my life? Is it the uncertainty? So I think understanding and knowing that is so important because that's what you're talking about with the outside influences, the media, et cetera, that can really have an impact on our lives. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's go over to radical accountability and dig into that a little bit deeper if we could. Um, talk about your philosophy and how this can help one propel themselves forward. Absolutely. So um, I, I'm a, uh, I've spent um, the first probably 25, 26, maybe even 27 years um, blaming the outside world for certain things in my life. And um, there was just a shift in my life and uh, at about when I was 25, where I was like, oh, I was like, I'm the common denominator here. So what is it that I can do better? And it could, I don't remember now what, it, what, what, what drove me. It's not nothing that I came up with on my, you know, on my own by any means. I'm not that bright, but it was just something I was, I heard something. So maybe I listened to a show or a podcast or read a book. It's probably one of those things. Cause I was in that self-development mode at that stage. Cause I was trying to find answers. And, and, and so, and I was like, oh, I was like, there's something to like actually like take an ownership and to my own BS, right? And what can I do differently? What can I do better? And so since that point, I've just really just looked at every situation as what am I learning from this? Where did I go wrong? Even if there was an external factors, what was it that I, what decision led me here? What was it that I've allowed? What was it that, you know, uh, um, 
what behavior did I show or whatever may be that has caused this. And I promise you, there's always, even somewhere, there's a slight, even in the worst situation, there's a slight thing that you probably could have done differently, right? And this is not to blame yourself. This is not to go into victim victim mindset by any means. I'm totally against that, the victim mindset. But it's more of just like, like trying to understand yourself deeper because being real with yourself, right? Like I think there's a saying, it's like there's a face we have with others. Um, there's like the public face, the private face, and then the secret face, right? Um, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, approach that there's so many different faces that we wear, but we have to be able to look at ourselves in a mirror and say, where can I do differently? What can I learn from this? Because, you know, and this is not about some like being positive. No, no, no. Like I'm, I'm a realist, you know, and sometimes things just suck and you should be sad and mad and upset and so on. But there's just a learning in everything. And so I've, I've kind of, that's kind of what I live by. Um, because the more you take accountability, the more power you take back. And the more you start to realize that you have more control than you imagine. And when you realize that, that alone is so powerful and so empowering in different ways. And you start to literally see your life change because you're like, wow, why didn't I do this sooner? Because I believe in energy. I believe in things that we put out there. Um, and um, and it all starts with us. And turning those challenges into opportunities. And that's what you did at a certain point in your life, too. Absolutely. Yeah, I've um, I I. I am look. I look at challenges as I always look at challenges and opportunities. I think just having that mindset focuses on helping you look for solutions versus going into that victimhood mentality and looking at the problem. Nothing happens if you just look at the problem all day. You got to focus on a solution. And I've I've gone through that journey on my own. There was a time in, in my life just a few years ago that I was, um, you know, at a stage in my life where my health was suffering. I was broke, um, single. I would just ended a relationship, didn't have a place to live at that time. I was moved back in with my parents essentially. And, you know, literally everything that could have gone wrong in my life has gone wrong in my life at the same, within a period of like a month. I'm not kidding, like within a month. Um, and so, um, I, I, I basically, you know, I, 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 I sat in that sadness for, for a little, for a little while, you know, by a little while, I mean, I think I gave myself like a few days to a week to just be sad and, you know, just be mad about the whole thing and everything that I've gone through. And then I was like, you know what, let me just create a plan of action. And I've created a plan to get myself out on you exactly what I had to do. Um, and, and, you know, through a lot of patience and, and time, I, I got out of that. You know, I, I the first thing I did, I remember I said, well, I need to fix my finances because that's probably one of the biggest stresses in life. Right. Is like not having a place to live on your own, not having income and so on. So that was kind of my main focus. And I just kept working, kept, kept getting myself out there, et cetera, to generate that income again. Um, and then from there, I, I was able to invest money into my health. I got a personal trainer. I got a lymph drainage masseuse who I still work with both of them to this day and just really took uh, took charge of my um of my health um because then the rest kind of follows right um so it's um i i i always look at back at that experience and say it just makes me feel so much more confident that I was able to go through that and come out of it, you know, 10 times better than even, you know, what it was before. Um, And that gives you so much power because you're like, wow, I did that. Like I did it, you know, Um, it's going through challenge is a blessing in its own. If you're willing to see it as that opportunity um, to, to just get better and grow and learn and so on. So And then at a certain point, that leads to your ability or one's ability to help others and make connections. Can you talk about empowering others through authentic connections? Yeah. uh, So as I mentioned before, you know, everybody's different. Everybody's unique. And I think through my own journey and just working with people, I realized that you just have to approach just about everything with empathy and humility. And I love having conversations and I love working with people because you start to realize how unique everybody is and how no matter how successful one is, no matter what title you have, no matter no matter how much money you have or what you drive, we all struggle with things. We all struggle with things. And I think if you just if you just understand that and you hear people that are supposed to be very strong and successful and have reached that pinnacle of of just achievements and 
when you hear their uh, struggles with mental health or physical things or um, or uh, imposter syndrome, and you realize that then they are all just human. And I think that if we just understand that, we'll be able, it'll just be a kinder world. Um, we'd look at each other differently. We'll, you know, I think the, the just the, the conflicts in the world will be much less because we all realize that we ultimately want the same thing. We strive for the same thing, which is just, you know, being safe, being around people that love us, you know, having having some kind of freedom, right, security, and just, you know, having a, a, a family, loved ones, and so on. And that's just the basic of all humans. And I've done this kind of work around the globe, and it's the same around the globe. No matter where you're from, who you are, we all ultimately want the same things. Um, and I think just understanding that um, just made me a better human and, you um, and made me able to connect to different individuals because I go in with a very open mind with no expectations. You know, we all have biases, of course, that's just natural subconscious that comes out. But I think I'm just more in tune of being able to connect with others in a, in a really authentic way. With your books, with your writing. So you have shift, which is, which is a guide. And then you have the book that was roughly facsimilated behind me the rough guide to awesome right leadership there. there it is they're much better than than my it's, it's, a, it's a really really good good one though you got and i know you're right you're you're working on some some other projects too i'm curious elena what have you learned about yourself during the process of writing and has that helped you hone and develop some of your philosophies uh, writing is much harder than one might imagine. <laughs> That's number one lesson. Um, I think that when we speak, and I'm a talker by nature, so I'm a person, I speak. Um, I, that's why I have a podcast. So speaking comes more natural to me than writing. I think when you have to convey a message in a written format, it forces you to, when you have to write something down, it forces you to almost question if what you're writing is like is that really true is that so it makes you pause and really think about what is it that you're putting out there versus when you speak right um or just when you're talking to somebody so i think that's been a lesson because and as as i wrote even like i, I think i mentioned this to you before you know like at, by the time we finished writing this book it was like oh like we could do an edit already because so many things change and they change so fast. And even uh, my own kind of um, approach and methodology changed as well. So like the three pieces that I talk about, the the physical, mental, and social, I don't think I mentioned that in the book. That was, that that's a realization I came to afterwards, you know, so that's going into the next book, right? Um, because it's just, you're continuously learning. And again, it goes back to the idea of not being married to a particular thought, an idea, a belief, and so on, being flexible uh, in that, you know, I think it's important to have certain set of values, certain things you believe in, certain things you practice, and certain basic human kind of uh, characteristics, you know, like humility and empathy and so on. But I think there's so much that happens in, in our lives and careers and the world that it's, it's silly to be married to a particular idea. And as you write and as you're putting things out there that are going to be out there way beyond when, you, you know, even when you're gone, I think you're just more in tune with that. And, and um, um, yeah, just more, you, you think, you think more deeply on those topics. Absolutely. It is quite a process and you're right. It's really hard to write. And it really, I, I love the way you describe you, you have your values. That's like your core, right? That's not as flexible, but having that flexibility to kind of change and ebb and flow and how one's writing can help bring that out. And Elena, you definitely are a talker. I love that about you. <laughs> and you mentioned you're a podcast host. So tell us where people can find your show. Absolutely. So I hang out the most on LinkedIn. That's where I hang out the most. But if somebody just Googles my name, Elena Agaragimova, you'll probably see more about me than you ever care to. Um, I also have a website, elenaagar.com. Um, so any of those places are good. My podcast is everywhere um, that I've mentioned. So it's all the ma major platforms, Spotify, Apple, so on. I love it. I love it. And okay, we let the cat out of the bag. You are working on another book. So I think, Elena, in the future, we'll have you back on the show so that you can talk about that. How's that sound? So, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Elena, for being with us. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today on the books that make you show. You can find out more about us on our website. 
that is books that make you.com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram, YouTube, of course, please subscribe, ring the bell, get notifications. Uh, when you're on our website, please sign up for the Webby Award winning books that make you newsletter and hang with us out on TikTok as well. Until next time, all of my bookish buddies, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The host and executive producer of the Books That Make You Show is Desiree Duffy. Sound mastering and engineering by Dave Napox. Social media and content promotion by Siddhi Jahagirdar. Copywriting and editing by Mike Robinson. The Books That Make You Show is an award-winning podcast produced by Black Chateau Enterprises. 